There's Periscope, and there's Facebook. What's up, y'all? Prophet David Taylor here, ready for my Thursday night teaching of No More Genies. If you're not familiar with my No More Genies series, I've been working on it for over a year now. No More Genies is a series uh, that I'm going through to help people get off of their genie concept of God, where we think that God is some type of genie and we can just rub the magic lamp and it'll do whatever we want. And we think that all we have to do is find the magic word, whatever the magic word is, and that that means that God will do whatever we want him to do, wave his hand, solve all our problems. And we don't have to do anything. That's why people love genie concept, because it means that we don't have to do anything. And many times when you hear people preach and teach in a lot of religious contexts, they always talk about what God's going to do. But very rarely do they talk about what we need to do. So my series is about <clears throat> helping believers get off of their genie concept of God where you think that God, you're just going to pop your fingers and God's going to do whatever you want because God don't serve us, we serve him. And God doesn't follow us, we follow him. Okay? And where you think there's some type of magic formula or magic word or magic access point where you don't have to do anything and you can just pop your fingers and a million dollars is going to rain out the sky or you're going to have this incredible relationship and all that. And people in the world make a lot of money selling people genie concept because people desperately want to believe it. They don't just want to believe it. They desperately want to believe it. But that's not what the word says. So on the second Thursday of every month, I do a deep dive into a particular subject and we see what the word actually has to say about the things that we care about so we can get rid of those false ideas, those false concepts, those false mythologies and actually do what the scripture says do. And then we can get the results that God promises us. All right. So uh, what I've been working on for a while now is uh, a series called We Do It Wrong. And long story short, there's so many things. Uh, in, in what has become Christian myth and Christian mythology in so many religious contexts, and I'm mainly talking about Protestants, that we just do wrong, that are just unbiblical. And that's why it doesn't have any power, and that's why people aren't getting delivered. So what I've been talking about for these last several weeks, excuse me, <coughs> what I've been talking about for these last several weeks was the idea of preaching what we call the gospel of Jesus Christ. But we do not preach the gospel that Jesus Christ preached. We preach born again, born again, get saved, get saved, miss hell, miss hell, go to church, go to church, go to heaven when you die. That's not what the Lord preached. <coughs> Excuse me, the Lord did not preach that one time. The Lord only mentioned born again one time. And he mentioned it in the context of his actual message, which was the kingdom. Jesus preached the kingdom, the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of God is like this, the kingdom of heaven is like that, and unless a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God, okay? So we've been looking at the parables that Jesus taught to see what the Lord actually said the kingdom was like, and for me personally, it's blessed my soul, because we've been able to, to get behind some of the stories that Jesus told and understand exactly what he was talking about, and how to apply that in our life, to throw out those old, bad, unhealthy genie concepts, and get the right idea in here and in here so we can get the results that God wants us to have. Because why in the world would you become a Christian and say that you believe that Jesus went through that agonizing death on Calvary's cross to pay for your sins, to get you born again, to get you a part of the kingdom, to get you reattached to Father God through Jesus Christ and make available for you the power of the Holy Spirit and then not walk in everything that he died to give you? That doesn't make any sense. But when you teach people that all your rewards are over there in glory and someday over there in Beulah land and, you know, and all this different kind of stuff, not understanding that everything about the kingdom is right now and everything that God says is right now because Jesus died to give us the victory in this life and the life to come. So we're supposed to be experiencing victory in this life and the world to come. Not waiting until we die, because if that was the point of being saved, we would get saved and drop dead. How come God doesn't just save people and just take them on to heaven if going to heaven is the point? You're already a part of the kingdom of heaven here on earth. 
And so what we need to learn is we need to study what Jesus actually said, practice those principles, and we can start to get the results that we're supposed to get in our lives now. Okay? All right, so let's say a word of prayer. We're going to dive into tonight's lesson. Father, I thank you so much. I thank you so much for access to your presence through Jesus Christ. I thank you for eternal life. I thank you for your word. I thank you for your spirit, oh God. I ask you to speak through me, oh God. Take over, oh God. Let your kingdom come and your will be done. Take over my mouth, my heart, my words, every part, oh God. I surrender. Not my will, but thine be done. And speak through me, oh God. And illuminate and breathe life into your word as only you can so that we can understand what you're saying and so we can understand what you want us to do with it and apply it to our lives. And we thank you for it and we believe you for it. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, amen and amen. Now, tonight's lesson is going to be another parable. Now, this is the, uh, the fourth? Yes, this is the fourth parable. So, in the previous videos, I talked about the parable, parable of the sower, the parable of the wheat and the tares, and last time I talked about the parable of the mustard seed. Tonight, I'm going to talk about the parable of the yeast or the leaven, okay? And that is found in Matthew 13, 33. It's only one verse that deals with this, and that's Matthew 13, 33. That's not the only place where Jesus tells the story, but what we're looking at tonight is just one verse to deal with this principle, okay? Matthew 13, 33. I'm going to read several different translations, as I always do. New International Version, he told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into about 60 pounds of flour until it worked through all the dough. New Living Translation, NLT, Jesus also used this illustration. The kingdom of heaven is like the yeast a woman used in making bread. Even though she put only a little yeast in three measures of flour, it permeated every part of the dough. Okay? Uh, the Berean Study Bible. He told them still another parable. The kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed into three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Okay? So we're going to do a deep dive to see what that has to do with us now and how we can apply this kingdom principle. Okay? Now, remember, I already, know, I already went over what parables are, but for those of you that haven't seen the other videos, a parable is a story. It's an analogy. Uh, many times uh, when the Lord said the kingdom of heaven is like that simile, okay, he's using the simile form of storytelling. So uh, the reason that the Lord uh, taught so much in parables is because parables can last across time. Because Jesus knew he had to both communicate his message to the people that were living in his day. So he had to speak in language and customs and, you know, how we use slang, when you, we use metaphors, we, knew, we use cultural references, we use things that we can understand. But the Lord also knew that thousands of years later, we'd be reading his words too. So he hid his truths inside of stories, inside of parables, inside of analogies inside of things that use natural things that you could see to help you understand spiritual, eternal things that you couldn't see with your natural eye. That's why he did it that way, okay? Because he was thinking of them and he was thinking of us. So that's why all these things are in parable form. So he told them still another parable, the kingdom of heaven. Remember, that's the true message of Jesus, the kingdom of heaven. Not born again, get saved, miss hell, go to heaven when you die, go to church. Kingdom of heaven is like yeast that a woman took and mixed in the three measures of flour until all of it was leavened. Now, most of the time in the Bible, yeast, and you know what yeast is, okay, something that you put in bread uh, to leaven it, fill it out, make it rise. Uh, most of the time in the Bible, yeast is viewed as a negative. It's viewed, uh, it's viewed as sin, as infection, as something that causes fermentation. It says, for example, in Galatians 5, 9, a little leaven leaveneth the whole lump. And what that means is that false teaching is like a little yeast that spreads through the whole batch of dough. So most of the time in the scriptures, when you see the word leaven or yeast, it's used as a negative example about how it just takes a little bit of bad teaching or just a little bit of sin. Or there's, there's a verse that says, one sinner destroys much good. Okay. So it's talking about how it just takes a little bit of sin and it can corrupt the whole thing. 
But in this context, the Lord is using that property in a positive frame. He's saying that his kingdom is like a little bit of yeast that you can put in 60 pounds of flour, but you can work it through all the dough. You can work it through all the bread and make the entire bread leaven. You can make all that flour leaven with just a little bit of yeast. Okay? Now, why is that important, and how does that apply to us? I'll tell you why. First of all, because a little bit of the Word of God can produce massive change. Now, the more words you get, the better, Matthew 4.4, 4, mankind shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceeds out of the mouth of God. But even a little bit, even a little bit of the Word of God can produce massive results. Uh, hold on, I want to look up the scripture because I want to show you this. In Matthew 15 and also in Mark 2, there's a story where a woman comes to Jesus and asks for a miracle, okay? And Jesus said it's not right to take the children's bread. He's talking about the Jews. When he says the children's bread, he's talking about Jewish people, the Hebrews, and toss it to the dogs. He means Gentiles. He means anybody that's not a Jew because to the Jew, the Gentiles were dogs. They had uh, they served idol gods. They ate things sacrificed to idols. They ate meat with blood in it. Had all kind of sexual immorality. They were as far from the covenant that God made with Abraham, Abraham and the Hebrews as possible in the way they thought and the way they lived. And so the Jews were taught to consider the Gentiles dogs, heathen, outside and divorced from the covenants of promise as opposed to the chosen people, the children, the seed of Abraham. Okay? So this woman was a Gentile, and she came to Jesus and asked for a miracle. And he said, it's not right for me to take what belongs to the Jews and give it to you, because you're a Gentile, you're a dog, you're a heathen, you're outside of the covenant. And the woman said, yeah, Lord, but even the dogs eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. And the Lord said, oh, woman, Jesus answered, your faith is great. Let it be done for you as you desire. And her daughter was healed from that very hour. What did that woman do? She called the Lord, Lord. She said, Lord, and whenever you call him Lord, you release his power. She said, even though I might be a dog, we eat the crumbs that fall from their master's table. Why did the Lord take that as an act of faith? Because what that woman was saying to Jesus is that there's enough power in your crumbs, even the crumbs of your word, even the, the crumbs that sprinkle down, they can have the loaf. I take the crumbs and there's enough power in the crumbs of your word to heal my sick child. That's why Jesus said, oh woman, great is your faith. You're not even a Jew. You're not even a Hebrew. You're not even of Israel and you still believe in me. So he said, let it be done for you as you desire. Because she called him Lord and released his power. And she said even a little bit of word, even the leftover word, even the word that the Hebrews don't want is enough to heal my child. And the Lord honored that because God always honors faith no matter who uh, it's in. But the point I want to show you in that verse is that she said the crumbs. She said, I don't need the loaf. I don't even need a slice. I don't even need a hump. She said, I take the crumbs. Okay? So even a little bit, even the crumbs of God's word have the power to work through whatever you put it in and leaven the whole lump, fill up the whole loaf of bread, fill up the dough, okay? So uh, that's the first point I wanted to make in terms of it going through until all of it was leavened. Now, every commentary that I read about this passage said that the parable of the mustard seed and this parable of the leaven or the yeast is talking about evangelism. It's talking about mission, mission, uh, missionary work. It's talking about how Preaching the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God is so powerful that it can permeate to every part of the world and permeate the earth and restore the earth and restore people to God and get people into the kingdom. Grant them knowledge, eternal life, and salvation and also, also uh, illumination, revelation, understanding of the word of God, connection back to God through Jesus Christ. All of that is true. But I have another revelation. I have another understanding along with that, and that is that the, the word of God, the leaven or the yeast of the word, is able to permeate every area of your life. I'm really big on that. 
your life. Do you know why? Well, I'll show you when I explain this to you. Your life has seven foundations. I want to be sure everybody can see me holding up seven. Your life has seven foundations, and here they are. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, and financial. One more time. Your life has seven foundations. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, and financial. That's your whole life. That's everybody's whole life, okay? Your spiritual life, uh, your walk with God, how you feed your inner man, how in touch with your inner vessel you are, your spiritual life, your mental life, what's going on in your thoughts, okay? Not just your level of education, but your thought patterns, how you think, how, how you see the world, how you process information, okay? Your attitude, your emotional life, how you feel, how you feel about yourself, your self-image. How do you manage your emotions? Do you suppress them? Do you repress them? Do you express them? Okay? Your physical life. So much with your physical self. Grooming, hair, teeth, eyes, skin, nails, clothes, laundry, diet, exercise, sexuality, stage of life. You know, you need some things as a baby, and then you need some things as a child. Then you need some things as a teenager. Then you need some things... As a 20-year-old and on and on, then you need some things as an older person, then you need some things as a corpse. <laughs> Your physical life, cradle to the grave or womb to the grave. Uh, social life, your relationships. Okay? Uh, there's your family relationships, but part of your family is your relatives, the people you were born to, and part of your family is the people that are about what you're about. That's family too. Okay, uh, your professional relationships, platonic relationships, casual relationships, okay, your social life, how you act uh, in a crowd, because everybody's different with that. Your vocational life, which is what you do for a living, or your career, or your purpose, or what you do to generate your income and, you know, take care of yourself. And then there's your financial life, how you generate money, what you do with that money, what you generate it. Also... Uh, money is also connected to your spiritual life because in the natural, money is a resource. But in the spiritual, money is a heart mirror. I'll say that one more time. In the natural, money is a resource. But in the spiritual, money is a heart mirror. So in other words, money is designed by God to show you what's really in your heart. And it works every single time. If you want to know who you are, just put some money in the mix, okay? And everything that you are and everything that you care about and everything that you really feel and really believe in here going to come rushing to the surface like that, okay? If you want to know who somebody else is, if you want to know who it is that you're dealing with, just put some money in the mix and watch how they act. Everything that they are Everything that they b really believe, everything that they really feel is going to come rushing to the surface because that's what money does, okay? In the natural, it's a resource. But in the spiritual, money is a heart mirror. It's designed by God to show you what's really in your heart, where your values are, what you really care about, what you really think and believe. It's all going to come rushing to the surface as soon as you put some money on the table. Why is that true? Because the Lord said, where your treasure is, there your heart is also. Because money is a heart mirror. Okay? So those are the seven foundations of your life. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, and financial. And so what I always preach and teach and what I'm living, because remember I tell you, I'm never out here prophesying or preaching and teaching about something that I'm not doing. What you want to do is you want, how to, you want to learn how to not just accept Jesus as Savior. To accept Jesus as Savior is A, B, C. A, admit that you're a sinner. B, believe that Jesus Christ is the Son of God, born of a virgin, died on the cross for your sins, rose again the third day, ascended to heaven, sits on the right hand of God. And C, confess all that with your mouth as you believe it in your heart. That's how you get saved. That's how you get born again. That's how you accept Jesus as Savior, ABC. The reason people preach that so much, and we're supposed to preach it, don't get me wrong, but the people, the reason uh, many times so many people stay there 
is because Jesus did all the work, and all you have to do is believe and receive it. All you have to do is ABC. Jesus took up his cross, and all you have to do is receive that in your heart. That's why so many people find it easier to accept him as Savior. But to accept him as Lord requires that you take up your cross if you want to follow him. As a matter of fact, I'm going to look that scripture up. So... you can understand what that is. That scripture is, uh, well, there's many different scriptures. The one I'm going to read is Matthew 16, 24. Matthew 16, 24. Then Jesus said to his disciples, Whosoever wants to be my disciple must deny themselves and take up the cross and follow me. Okay, Berean Study Bible. Then Jesus told his disciples, if anyone wants to come after me, he must deny himself and take up his cross and follow me. Okay? So the Lord said, if you want to follow him, if you want to accept him as Lord, you have to take up your cross, deny yourself, and follow him. Okay? And so accepting him as Savior is ABC. Accepting him as Lord is HBO. That's hear, believe, and obey. And to hear the Lord and to believe the Lord and definitely to obey the Lord, you have to take up your cross. You have to crucify yourself. You have to crucify your flesh. And your flesh is that rebellious nature that we're all born with because of Adam's sin. You have to crucify your self-will. You have to crucify your tendency to walk according to your senses, sight, uh, sound, smell, taste, and touch. To think that what you experience with your five senses is all there is. Okay? You have to crucify your way of doing things. You have to take up your cross. You have to crawl up on it and die. Die to what you think. Die to what you want to do to follow the Lord. People don't preach and teach that nearly as much, especially not like they used to. Because I heard that a lot when I was a child. And when I would hear it, it would, it would get on my nerves. They would say, no cross, no crown. Old folks used to say that all the time. Okay, but it's true. I had to learn how to take up my cross just like everybody else. But that's supposed to be the first thing we do. That's the first thing you're supposed to learn when you come into the kingdom. That you just accepted him as Savior, and now you're born again. But now you have to accept him as Lord so you can, uh, HBO, you can hear, believe, and obey. That's how you get victory in this life. So according to the seven foundations, I stop by to tell you that God wants to get into every dimension of your life. I have discovered in my travels and in my journeys that a lot of people don't know that about God. They don't understand God in that way. So many people have this concept of God that he's out there somewhere. He's out there, but he's not near you. He doesn't get me. He doesn't live in 2019. He doesn't understand uh, my language. He doesn't understand slang, what I'm going through. Uh, you know, he's mean or he's removed or he's old or he's not relevant, or he's archaic, and all those impressions that you've got, you've got those from religion. That is not who the Lord is. The Lord is alive. The Lord is power. The Lord is love. The Lord already knows the end from the beginning. The Lord is getting us ready for 2020 now. The Lord has been sending prophetic words uh, all throughout the month of September, and definitely through the month of August, but August, we finished up the summer, but all throughout the end of August and the month of September, the Lord has been sending prophetic words through his prophets to get people ready for 2020. And what's my tagline? What do I say all the time? I say that God already told you what was going to happen if you had just listened to his servants, the prophets. Okay? So that whole old sitting on a rocket chair with a long beard, archaic, uh, uh, detached idea of God is religion. But I've discovered how many people think that and feel that and believe that. And they don't want to hear nothing about accepting Jesus as Lord because they want to run their lives and they want to do what they want to do. And they don't want to hear nothing about it. And I've discovered that a lot of Christians are like that too. They accepted him as Savior. They got born again. But they don't want to grow any further than that. They don't want to move past that with God. Okay? Well... Uh, what I stopped by to tell you is that the truth is, is that if you want to get into the blessing in every area of your life, you're going to have to let the Lord begin to speak to you 
in all seven areas of your life. And then even a little bit of word will make a huge difference in each one of the seven areas of your life. And that's how you begin to manifest victory. I was just talking to my son about it today. We were talking about the area of diet and exercise and how so many people culturally uh, don't teach anything about diet. And so we end up eating our way into problems, eating our way into hypertension, uh, which is high blood pressure, eating our way into high cholesterol, eating our way into uh, just being so heavy, your bones can't hold up your weight, eating our way into obesity, eating our way into cancers, just so many different things come from a poor diet. And I've discovered a lot of people don't understand that the Holy Spirit of God will speak to you about your diet. He will, in fact, speak to you about every area of your life. But the reason I read you the scripture, uh, Matthew 16, 24, about taking up your cross is because you're going to have to learn how to be sensitive to what the Lord is saying about that area so you can HBO, so you can hear him, believe him, and obey him. Because that's how you get the fullness of life in this life. Okay? What if the Lord tells you about some stock to invest in? What if the Lord tells you when there's going to be a sale on a piece of property? Uh, one time I got blessed because the Lord led me to a store and they had an incredible sale. I was uh, in the market to buy some stickers that I was going to use for uh, something I was putting together. Those stickers were normally... $42 a pack. I felt the Lord press me to go to the store. Go, go, go. Deal with this. Deal with it. I felt the, and I felt the Spirit of God pressing on me, pressing on me. And I kept trying to work on something else for the day. And the Holy Ghost was like, no, no, no. Pay attention to this. Pay attention to this now. And I said, okay. So I started working on this thing. And then I went to the store that I had priced those stickers at. Not only were those stickers on sale for like $10 from 42 but they were on sale also buy two, get one free. So I walked out of that store with three packs of stickers. Normal retail price would have been like $120. I walked out with those three packs of stickers for $22 because I paid $10 for two and got the third one free. Because the Spirit of God told me to focus on that project for the day and go to this store, and he led me to that kind of deal. Some of y'all don't believe it. I don't care because it happened. I saved the money, and I got the stickers to prove it. So that's what I mean. That's an example of what I'm saying, is that I have discovered a lot of people don't understand that God will speak to you in all seven areas of your life, not just about your spiritual life, because you are one person. All seven of those areas are integrated. But that's just it. They're all integrated. And you need the Word of God in each area. And there are commands in the Bible as to what to do with your spirit, with your inner man. This right here. The breath of life inside of you. When God made people, what did he do? He formed their bodies and he leaned over and blew life into them. And man became a living soul. Well, it's the breath of life in you that, that uh, animates your physical clay body. But that's also the part of you where the Spirit of God dwells. That's also the part of you where your faith is. That's in your spirit. That's also the part of you where the Word of God has to get into and get mixed with faith so it can manifest in your life. Uh, imaginations, dreams, prophetics, seeing things before they happen, being connected to heaven, open visions like Peter had an open vision, like Jacob had a vision of the ladder with angels, Ascending and descending, all that comes through the Spirit, through the Spirit to your Spirit, because it doesn't come through your natural body. That's why people that aren't saved, the Lord says, the Bible says clearly, that people that aren't saved don't have the Holy Ghost, they don't know Him, they can't see Him. So people that aren't born again do not have access to the Holy Spirit of God. But those of us that are saved, we do. And so God begins to teach you how to maximize that the breath of life inside of you, okay? But that's not the only thing that God speaks to. And so some of y'all, if you have an extensive church background, you might have heard your whole life that only dealing with the spiritual is the only thing. Well, things may have root in the spiritual, but there's, they still have different manifestations in the natural, okay? 
For example, your mental life, you know, dimension number two, that has everything to do with your thoughts, what you expose your brain to. Now, the Bible says, as a man thinketh in his heart, so is he. That's on the inside of you. That's your nature. And some of the thoughts that you think come from within. But then there's such a thing as nurture. And that has to do with the things you expose your mind to, your level of education, the kind of movies you watch, the kind of TV shows that you watch, the kind of videos that you watch on YouTube, the kind of books that you read. Okay? That has everything to do with what's going on here. Haven't you ever watched something before you went to bed and then you had a dream about that very thing? Because you expose your mind to it. Okay? And then one of the things that the Lord taught me, one of the things that my uh, one of my fathers in the ministry taught me, Pastor B.J. Tatum in the Canaan Baptist Church Champaign, excuse me, in Urbana, Illinois, one of the things he taught me is you uh, always have to ask yourself, what are you saying to yourself? And the Lord said that to me recently. What are you saying to yourself? In other words, what's the video? What's the tape? What's playing in your mind? Because every day, as you're going through your day, you got a reel, man. You got a tape. You got a video. You got something playing over and over in your head. You have self talk. That's in your mind. Okay? So, what are you saying to yourself? That has everything to do with your attitude, with how your day goes, your expectation. Okay? All that's up here. And if you know anything about the brain, you know that we never forget anything. It's just that uh, most of our stuff goes into our subconscious memory. And I'm so glad that God designed the brain that way. Because if he didn't, that means everything would be in our conscious memory and we go crazy. If everything was uh, that you knew was right there all the time, then, oh. So praise God for the way he designed the brain. But remember, all it takes is a smell. You can smell some cooking and smell like mama's cook, cooking and... Just like that, you're back in your mother's kitchen and you're four years old again. A song, songs do it all the time. You can hear a song and it reminds you of where you were when you first heard that song. You know why? Because you still remember. Because it's still in your brain. It's just in your subconscious. Okay? Then there's your emotions. Okay? In your soul. How you feel. Okay? How you really feel. Now, your surface emotions are right here on the surface, okay? And sometimes if somebody just, you know, gives you a quick touch, the surface emotions can come out. But your real emotions, your deepest emotions, are way down in your gut, way down in your belly. And your deepest emotions always come with tears. Have you ever noticed that? Have you ever noticed that whenever you start talking about how you really feel about anything and you open up and you start to get deep with it, it comes with tears every time. Because your deepest emotions come with cleansing. Okay? Uh, your physical self. That's the one that everybody's obsessed with. Because remember, most of us are sight walkers. So you're obsessed with everything. Uh, especially here in America. Your teeth. Shape of your nose. Your, you know, your, your skin. Your eye color. Shape of your eyes. Those of you that have hair. I got hair. But anyway. Your hair. Your hair color. Your hairstyle. Uh, your clothes. You know, all of your grooming that you go through, because we know some people don't groom at all, and some, some people have poor grooming. But anyway, all your grooming, uh, your diet, we talked about diet, your exercise, if you exercise at all, the kind of exercise that you do, um, kind of clothes that you wear, your laundry, do you use fabric softener, can your skin take stuff like that, your sleep patterns, Lord have mercy, your rest patterns, do you rest at all? Because some people are workaholics, they just work around the clock until they their body starts to break down. Some people on the other end, they are lazy. And they do as little work as possible. All that has to do with your physical self. And all of that affects you and your day and your life. Everything I just named in your physical life. And God has commandments on every single thing I just named. Does God have commandments about my clothes? Yes, he does. He really does. Okay? Okay. About your diet, everything. About your grooming, everything. Everything. Some people have even used their faith to grow new teeth. I know some of y'all don't believe that. I don't care. Some people have used their faith to grow new teeth and grow new limbs. And I saw this one video about this girl who had this terrible skin disease. Her skin was coming off in scales. Her skin was peeling off and just, just drooping off her face like it was, it was clay or pus. It was very, very... Gross, and this little girl had to be all of nine. They brought in a prophet, prayed over that girl. Her skin healed up, and it became smooth as a baby's skin. 
I kid you not, it's on YouTube. Look up the video. I believe she's Indian. I don't remember her name, but I believe that miracle happened with a happened with an Indian girl. Okay? That's your faith, something in your spirit manifesting out here in your physical body. Then there's your social, your social life. Those are your relationships. Close relationships, intimate relationships, you know, professional relationships, platonic, because everybody's at different levels of degrees of closeness to you. God cares about each one of those relationships. God cares about who you do business with. God cares about how you do business. He has commands in the Bible for who you do business with and how you personally do business. Yes, he does. Yes, he does. Then there's your vocational life. Some people think that you're supposed to work a job. Some people think you're supposed to have a career. But what you actually are supposed to have is a purpose. Okay? And everything about your daily activities in terms of your vo vocation are supposed to serve your purpose. That's why if you're just working a job, that's why you're not happy. That's why you're frustrated. That's why it seems like it's so much trouble to try to go to the gig every day. Because you're not supposed to have a job. You're not even supposed to have a career. You're supposed to have a purpose. Because people talk about your career, which tends to impact uh, whatever it's going to impact while you're alive. God talks about your purpose. Because you served a purpose before you were born. When you still lived in eternity with God before your parents ever got together, you were serving a purpose then. And God was tuning you up for the stuff he wanted you to do on earth. And then when you fulfill the will of God, when you do what the Lord tells you to do on earth, people keep calling that your career and, you know, are you going to retire and blah, 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 blah. That's the way man thinks. That's not the way God thinks. How do I know that you can I prove that? Yes, I can. Because Moses is still blessing us to this day with all that he did in his life. Moses gave us the first five books of the Bible, the Ten Commandments, uh, the Ten Plagues of Egypt, the trip out of Egypt, the Exodus, through the wilderness, manna from heaven, quail uh, from the sea, water from the rock, went to the Red Sea, pillar of fire, stopped Pharaoh, parted the Red Sea. Moses did all that, okay? And what people would call his career. But it's still blessing us now. Now, okay? Apostle Paul wrote the majority of the New Testament. We still live off of his words, okay? See, so God doesn't give you a career. That's what man says. Okay? And God doesn't give you a job. That's what man says. God gives you a purpose. And your purpose is supposed to be reflected in your vocation. What you spend 6, 8, 10, 12 hours a day doing every day is supposed to be according to why God sent you into earth. And then finally, your money. Last but not least, certainly not least, your finances. Okay? How to generate money. How to invest money. How to multiply money. What you're supposed to do with it when you get it. How to keep it how to pass it on through the generations, what it really is. Like I told you at the top, it was a heart mirror, all that. God has commandments for each one of those areas I just went through. Spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, financial. And God wants to become the Lord of your life so he can take the leaven of his word and even by giving you a little bit of word, that word will begin to work through and you begin to realize victory. Like, I, for example, I spent the summer uh, losing weight. I spent the summer uh, changing my diet, upping my exercise, increasing my water, increasing my vegetables. I lost weight. My numbers got better. Uh, skin got better. Just a whole lot of stuff got better because I cut out some stuff and put some healthy stuff in. And that was like my, my goal for the whole summer. And now the entire way I eat, if, you, if I looked at the way I ate like in March and looked at the way I eat now, all that's changed. Okay? And that was something I was working on for years. Okay? Because the Lord talked to me about that a long time ago. But the point I'm trying to make is that, yes, God wants to deal with you in that way and on that level. And some of y'all, nobody ever told you that. Some of y'all, this is the first time in your life you ever took a step back and looked at every dimension of your life. And somebody ever told you that God speaks to every dimension. So right now, I break the spirit of religion. I break the curse of religion. I break the trap of tradition. I break the spirit of denominationalism, the tradition of, traditions of men that make the word of God of none effect. And I cast it out and I break it off of you in Jesus' name to help you understand that God is a person, not a set of rules. God is a person, okay? Not something that you go to church or synagogue and temple and check off your religious boxes and I'm okay now. And then you don't think about God till next Saturday or next Sunday. No, he's a person that you spend time with 
and get to know. And, and you don't just want to accept him as Savior. You also want to accept him as Lord and let him begin to speak to each one of the seven areas of your life and you begin to see victory. Why do you think so many people struggle with marriage? Because they're not doing what the Lord says do. Why do you think so many people struggle with their diet and their health? Because they're not doing what the Lord says do. Why do you think so many people want to find the right career or the right place to live or the right city to live in, but they're not sure? Because you need a prophetic word from the Lord about what house to buy, because the ground that you live on is really important. Did you know that the things that you do on a parcel of earth, whatever is done on the earth by man, it actually goes in the ground itself? Did you know that? Mm-hmm. So if there are good deeds done on the ground, it actually goes into the ground. And if there's evil done in that land, it permeates in the ground too. Did you know that? So where you live physically is super important, okay? And only the Holy Ghost can show you what God has picked out uh, for you to live because that makes a huge difference. See, that's what I'm saying. So it's time, it's actually past time, but it's past time for believers to accept him as Lord in every area of your life and a little bit of yeast, a little bit of leaven of the word of God planted in each one of those seven areas will begin to manifest in the full victory in your life. So you can have the right view of God so that you can be feeding your inner man and building your faith and walk in miracles, signs and wonders so you can cast out demons, so you can uh, uh, perform miracles, so you can flow in the prophetic. So you can have open vision, so you can heal the sick, so you can raise the dead, so you can know what's going to happen before it happens, so you can crucify your flesh, so you can resist the devil. This is normal. This is what we're supposed to be doing as believers. But also so you can get your thoughts together, so you can increase your thought life, so you can make your thoughts be what they need to be, so you can have the right feelings about yourself. A couple days ago, I was feeling kind of low, and I went into prayer, and I went into praise, and I started praising God, and I praised him until I felt better. I started extolling his virtues. I started talking about how good he was. I started counting my blessings. I used my mouth to start confess my blessings. And the more I praised him and the more I raised my hands, I felt better and I had a good day because I praised my way right out of that situation. Why? Because I used my mouth and I used my faith and I used my mind to focus on God and talk about how good he was and it changed my emotional state. Okay? I told you about my project over the summer. It was changing my diet. Uh, you know, riding my bike, exercising, went back to the gym, got a gym membership. Um, vocationally, making sure you have the right people in your life. God will speak to you about every relationship you have. Now, let me say this. I know that many times we don't want to hear what the Lord has to say because we don't want him to tell us no. We don't want him to say something we don't want to hear. We don't want him to tell us that we have to let certain people go. I stopped by to tell you, it's going to happen. Some people, you're going to have to let them go. Some people, the Lord is going to tell you, leave that relationship alone. Some people, the Lord is going to tell you, don't even fool with them. Don't even go over there. Don't even let them in your life. You have to learn how to let the Lord be the Lord of your life because that's what saves you all the trouble and the drama and the pain you grow through when you have bad relationships. And I don't just mean romantic relationships and I don't just mean marriages. I mean friends. A whole lot of people ain't your friend. We misuse that word. The Spirit of God knows what's inside of somebody, and the Holy Ghost can tell you, leave that person alone. Holy Ghost can tell you to stay away from them, and God will speak to you like that. And many times, you've heard that still, small voice speaking to you in that area of your life, and you just ignored it. That was the Holy Ghost. That's the Lord talking to you. And then you went through all that drama and all that trouble. You could have skipped all of it if you had listened to the Lord, if you believed that God will speak to you about your relationship. He'll speak to you about your children if you're a parent. He'll speak to you about your parents if you're the child. He'll speak to you about your family lineage, about your genealogy, about your family history. There's no area of a relationship that the Lord won't speak to you in, both through the scripture and through the revelation and the prophetic of the Holy Ghost. Yes, he will. Yes, he will. And I explained to you about purpose. Uh, God is the only one that actually knows your purpose because he's your creator. I stop by to tell you that your mother does not make you. Your mother carries you. Your father does not make you. Your father sires you. He releases his seed into your mom. But God is the one that decides which seed is going to fertilize that egg so that your body looks a certain way. And then God knits your spirit and soul and body together so that you come out, you, when your mother pushes you out of uh, her womb. But your mother does not make you. Ask a pregnant woman, what color are your child's eyes? She don't know. 
She got to wait till you come out and see. Ask a pregnant woman, how tall will your child be when he's 10 years old? She don't know. She got to wait till you turn 10 and see. But God knows because God is the one that makes you. That's why you have to let the Lord tell you, what is my purpose? And then finally, your finances. Now, I've heard some people say, I've got to look at all this because I have to tally them up for myself because I don't like for, my, for myself, myself. I have to tally them up for myself because I don't like saying things that I haven't investigated. But I've heard people say that the Bible has more scriptures about money than it does about love. That's entirely possibly true. I do know that the Bible talks about money from Genesis to Revelation. I don't know, well, I do know why, uh, but people have uh, a hang-up about money, both saints and sinners, both saved and unsaved, both believers and unbelievers, have this huge hang-up about money. I don't care. I go by what the Word says, okay? And God has a lot to say about money, not just one or two things. Literally, from Genesis to Revelation, the Bible, Genesis to Revelation, the Bible is talking about money. I kid you not. Okay. So to review, our scripture today was uh, Matthew thirteen and thirty three, and we're talking about the true message that Jesus preached, which was about the kingdom of heaven. And this parable, this one verse parable, is about yeast that took uh, that a woman took and mixed in about sixty pounds of flour, and it worked through all that dough, signifying that a little bit of yeast or leaven can make the whole bread rise. It can permeate all of the bread. And in our lives, a little bit of the word of God from his kingdom, his kingdom has enough power to permeate your whole life, to give you victory in every, in every area of your life. And I went through the seven foundations of life, spiritual, mental, emotional, physical, social, vocational, vocational, financial, and uh, wanted to let you know that the Lord will speak to you in every area. And once you learn how to HBO, Accept him as Lord and begin to obey. He will give you victory in each one of those areas. All right. Amen and God bless. That's the lesson for tonight. So when you see me close my eyes and speak in tongues, I'm asking the Holy Ghost, are there any more prophetic words he wants me to release? Uh, is there uh, any more financial words? Any demons need to be cast out? Anything need to be broken off people and physical healing? So that's what I'm doing now. prophetic word. <clears throat> For behold, my people, the days come and now are. Well, I shall begin to speak in every dimension in your life. I'm going to speak in deeper dimensions. I'm going to speak in ways that only your spirit can understand. So you need to develop your prayer language. Develop your life in speaking in tongues. For I'll be whispering mysteries. I will be giving revelations. I will be giving visions. I will be speaking of things yet to come but I will be speaking to your inner man and not always in your native language. So develop your prayer language. Learn how to speak in tongues at an even deeper and greater level. And I will begin to drop and reveal and expound and expand and open so many things for you in every dimension of your life to establish my kingdom and give you full prosperity, peace, shalom in every area of your life, says the Spirit of the living God. Amen, amen. If you have any prayer requests, put them on the screen right now. Now remember, I can't always see everything that scrolls past. So if you put it up there and I, I miss it, I don't I see it right now. When I get through with the broadcast, I'll pray for it. So put your prayer requests on the screen. And if, if, I, if you don't see me pray for them right now, it's because I don't see them. Because sometimes I can't see everything that's scrolling past. So put it on the screen, though. Put it in the chat. And then um, I will pray for them when I see them. Okay? Okay, I'm not getting anything right now, but that doesn't mean you're not out there. So put them on the screen and I'll pray for them, okay? So that concludes tonight's teaching. Um, I have a book launch that I'm doing next Tuesday for my two new Christmas books called My Alphabet is Christmas. And I'm so excited about that. I'm using multiple concepts, teaching ABCs and history and tradition. And in the Christian one, I'm also teaching scripture. I'm so excited, so excited about that. So I'm going to do a Facebook Live for that book launch on Tuesday, October 15th at 8 o'clock p.m. on my author page. But I'm also going to do uh, 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. But I'm also going to do like a live viewing party on my personal page. So find me, David Taylor II, 
Uh, if you know me as Prophet David Taylor, you can find my personal page and find that. It's going to be a live launch on Facebook of my two new Christmas books, Tuesday, October 15th, 8 o'clock p.m. Central Standard Time. I'll be here Sunday, 2.30 p.m., my regular, our regularly scheduled time, to do my weekly live prophetic word, and then this video will be on YouTube in a short amount of time. I also have my prophetic devotional coming next year for 2020 to where all of you that want to get into the prophetic, I have a devotional where every day we look at a new scripture and you can learn how to let the Lord speak to you out of that scripture uh, prophetically because each scripture has to do with a prophecy or a prophet or a prophetic word or defining different types of prophecy. Okay, I'm super excited about that too. And I got some more stuff coming for 2020 yet that you know, I can't tell you yet, but that's plenty going on. So I got a lot of good things happening. Thank you so much. I appreciate your support. I appreciate those of you that watch me live. I appreciate those of you that are watching the replay. I say it every week. I count it an honor to be used of God because God does not need me. And I'm happy to be used of him. And I want to encourage you to surrender your life to Jesus. Don't just accept him as Savior. Accept him as Lord so he can give you the victory in every area. And remember that a little yeast, a little leaven, a little bit, a little crumb, a little bit of his word applied to every area of your life will give you massive results and give you victory. Amen. God bless. I will see some of you on Sunday for my weekly live prophetic word, 2.30 p.m. Central Standard Time, Facebook Periscope, YouTube. And some of you I will again see on Tuesday, October 15th, for the book launch of My Alphabet is Christmas, Tuesday, October 15th, 8 p.m. Central Standard Time, also on Facebook Live. Thank you, and God bless.